And I, we are recording technically. So welcome to another episode. And today's a very exciting one of what you need is a damn good listening to with me, Chris Grimes. It's not got the catchiest acronym, YWDIG. So I'm going to shorten it eventually to a GLT with me, CG. Thank you. And anyway, enough about me. Let's get straight on to the topic. Like sandwich. Now. Are you Sounds like a sandwich. Did you say, can I have a sandwich? No, it, said, it sounds like a sandwich, a GLT. Yes, it's a slippery slope was my joke that I didn't get onto, to a G&T with me, CG, oh. eventually. So, in fact, when hey. I, can, I want to come and visit your barn, Mr John Hartock, because your home looks glorious. You're very welcome. I have, I have some straw in the back room. <laughs> An afternoon straw, there. I love that. So, um, I'm talking to John Hartock, who I have known for many, many years because he was one of the uh, wonderful gallery of really seminal acting teachers that I had myself at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. And the lovely uh, John Hartock was in, in that salubrious gallery, but also he was one of the people that did my weekend school that allowed me to get into the school into the first place. So people in our lives that have great impact on us, we don't necessarily appreciate what impact we're having, but this lovely man was a sort of gatekeeper to what I do even to this day, actually. But this is John Hartock, who is, uh, or was rather, you're still a director for the Old Vic Theatre School, aren't you? I do a bit of teaching there, less and less as time goes on. Lovely. And you've started doing, of late, the most beautiful poems on Facebook which reintroduced me to you. And you, you remind me really of um, the sort of vocal tones of Oliver Postgate, who used to do bag puss. You've got, you've got a glorious voice. That's very interesting because when I tell stories, I always start out trying to sound like him. Uh, and then eventually, uh, eventually my, my own self comes through, <laughs> which is not quite as good. But. But isn't that lovely? Who we admire, we end up sort of resonating yes. with. And, and yes. I had no idea that you would have, that would have made sense to you, that link I made about your vocal tone. Oh, yes. Oh, it's a very, a very squashy old bagpuss. And, and if I may, John, you two are, are you're aging beautifully. You are a very squashy old bagpuss yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell my partner they said that. She'll be very pleased. <laughs> More than welcome. And so, yes, so welcome to this programme where we're, we're going to introduce you to lots of lovely storytelling archetypes, uh, John. We're going to bring you to a clearing. There's a tree within this clearing where we shake the tree to see which apples fall out. And the apples are going to take the form of a storytelling exercise, which is called 54321, which we'll talk about shortly. And then uh, there's some alchemy, some gold and a cake. So that, that's what we've got to explore, which is really exciting. So uh, okay. first question. Um, How's morale for you in these rather weird times, John? Uh, up and down is the answer to that. I mean, at first it was, well, it was all that good weather. And I live in this beautiful uh, rural environment. And so everything was fine. We were out every day and we were just sort of, you know, sitting around and drinking our gin and tonics and um, uh, enjoying, enjoying the weather in the countryside. As mm -hmm. time has gone on, it's got more tedious. Yes. Um, and, ah, uh, you know, I'm now sort of nearly five years out of retirement, I think, into retirement. Um, and I never really meant to retire. I always said I was retiring from the post at the theatre school, not from, yeah. uh, not from activity, as it were. Um, and what's happened, of course, is that COVID has increased the, or, or decreased the activity that one can achieve so um so i i did have a one-man show going out a two-man show going out uh which was literally about a week off uh its first performance when um when this uh took over um and um it's it it it, it gets quite difficult at times now because i'm bashing my head and wondering what to do and of course the poems putting the poems on facebook has been one of the things that's given me a bit of fun and a bit of creativity and uh, and uh, and sending them out there into the universe to see if anything comes back and your most recent one talking about sending it out there into the universe it's the most extraordinary yeah. um well i loved it it was about a sort of a, a cataclysmic interstellar event so do you want to talk us through what that's about yeah well there was this um moment in i think it was nine, uh, 2018 um 
when scientists recorded uh, the collision of two neutron stars. Um, and I heard it on the radio and it was anticlimactic. Um, and this, this strange feeling, it's such a, an enormous event in space, which, which even though somebody has told me it wasn't that enormous, at least not enormous for space since, but you know, it got me thinking about the idea that sort of whole civilizations might have perished in that one little whimpering sound. And, it's sort of um, like and, then, and then because I, I was close to somebody who was going through quite heavy grief at the time, I, I noticed that um, she was, that at night she was having a really hard time, but the following day, the sound of the Somerset steam railway hoot made her smile. I sort of put these two things together because it's one of the things that interests me how, 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 this is a laughter show, how much grief, <laughs> how much grief means to us, how much, how much we can take of it, how much it fills us up. And when we're filled with grief, supposing something else happens for which we grieve, is there more space for it yeah. or not? And the idea of comparing something which might have destroyed whole civilizations with something that is something maybe like the death of a hamster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can, can, you know, do they mean anything together? Can they be, and, and how does a human being react to it? So that, all that's sort of what I was thinking about. I just, it's the mortal sort of drop in the ocean and the cataclysmic sort of manifestation of just the sound is something like, I ain't, it's, it's yeah, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we are very, there was actually a bit more of it, which you couldn't hear really on the radio. There's a sort of woo, 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 woo sound before the whoop, and then there's a at the end of it. And uh, I, took, I, I did have that on the recording. I took that out because it wasn't what I'd first heard. What I'd first heard was that real sort of whoop, and that's it. And I absolutely love that, that someone's entire life and entire civilizations comes down to woo, 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 whoop. Yeah, you get it, you see. I'm not sure that everybody gets it, but that, that's one of the things about putting these poems out, you know. Uh, getting the odd message back from somebody, it actually meant something to you, it actually got it. Yeah, yeah. I, um, honestly, I, I, I adored it and I couldn't wait to speak to you about yeah. it. And, and it, just to put it out there, as, well, as this is to amplify, you know, your story, obviously. Um, it's, is it called Tidal Flow? Forgive me if I got the title wrong. Tidal Thoughts. Tidal Thoughts. And yeah. uh, available at all. It's all really, the, grief, the grief was like, a, was like a tidal wave. And then I sort of imagined from this sound actually flowing out as if, as if on a boat through space, past everything you know to the point where this happened and then flowing back into the radio with the sound coming out basically yeah and the tidal nature of grief too the tidal nature of grief that you know you it, it engulfs you and then it recedes and then it comes back in again and etc etc it just beautiful so if that hasn't hooked people to go and find out this poem i, I honestly it is glorious you, you don't have to it off by heart do you because we could bank that for something we could do at the end. I did at the time. I'm not sure I do now. In a, in a minute, because of the, the lovely spontaneity of what I'm trying to, you know, what we're doing here, this is a, a lovely conversation, is I'm very, very happy that you would take a couple of moments to go and get it and then do a sight reading of it. Or even, or even play it, I don't know. But anyway, I'm just putting that out there. Okay, we might be able to try. It's essentially, it's on here. Ah. I, it's on my machine. On your machine. Uh, I'm not sure I've got hard copy of it. Well, I tell so, you, I'm thinking out loud here. I can do a link to it based off the back of what it is. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. That's probably better. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> it's got the sound on it. And, and by the way, I'm intrigued often by something called the story behind the story. Um, is there anything else that you'd be willing to tell us about what the circumstance of the grief was? Because it was it you grieving or someone close to you grieving? It was someone close to me grieving. Uh, it doesn't really want to be part of the conversation. Wonderful. Uh, but I, I love the, just the, the, in, the, the beauty and the depth of what it is, you know, with someone who's now, you know, it, it's wisdom when someone is able to just be so deeply connected 
in the Thank way you. that I'm experiencing through your practice. That's, that's a lovely thing to say. <coughs> a lovely thing to say. Have you heard, I mean, thinking about that, it's not exactly wisdom, it's experience. Have you heard that proverb, which may be Chinese or it may actually be Belgian? <laughs> um, okay, Belgian proverb. Don't let's not the Belgians. Um, uh, we may need them in the future. Um, <laughs> the wonderful thing that I heard the other day, which is experience is the comb that life gives you once you are bald. Ah. Oh, just say that again. I love that. Experience is the comb that life gives you once you are bald. John Hartop, that's a bit of a drop the mic moment, but we've only just begun. I just, that's a gorgeous quote. Thank you. Cheers, isn't it? Wonderful. <laughs> Oh, anyway, this is lovely stuff. I love that quote. So um, let's put you through the ringer of bringing you to the clearing. So where does John Hartock go in order to get clutter-free, inspirational, and to just think? I'm one of those people, I think, who has an irritating habit of going into himself rather a lot. I'm inside myself a lot of the time. So I have plenty of clutter. I don't necessarily need to be away from physical clutter. I do need to be away from mental clutter, which means that I often don't listen to what people are saying to me <laughs> because I'm actually thinking of a song or a poem or whatever else, trying to get back into myself. So when we go walking, my partner Claire is is she's she's lived in the countryside for a long time she's absolutely devoted to gardening the countryside the animal life the plant life the wind the clouds the sky etc cetera, etc cetera. i go out and i have about five minutes of that and then i go into myself and i start thinking okay what was that what was that poem i was working on what was that song i was working on um and then suddenly realize she's been talking to me about some aspect of nature that i haven't noticed and I'm inside myself, and it can be very irritating, I'm told. Um, but that's sort of, I just go in. But that means sometimes cutting off from other people. I completely and utterly relate to that because similarly, I do that type of, I'm present, but I'm somewhere else being immune. Yeah. And I love your expression, I'm, I'm, I'm in myself as opposed to up yourself, which is your... Which is more frustrated, might think, would you just get out your ass? That and is the alternative expression, which has been you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it'd be quite dangerous for us to go out for a walk together because we'll both go it to something be, completely different. We'd probably walk off a cliff or something like that. <laughs> like a couple of gorgeous dodos that we are. Fantastic. Yeah. So anyway, uh, thank you for that. So we, we're in your clearing. So with your permission, I'd now like to join you in your clearing, which could be outdoors, but in your head, as you head, work on yeah. the of choice. And then within yeah. your clearing now, there is a, a tree, which we're going to shake this tree to see which apples fall out. So you've got, um, tell me about any one of those apples to do with, and I can't remember because of how long we've been riffing, whether I actually said what the 54321 represents yet. Can you remember? I think the four was things that shape. Yes. The three was things that inspire. The two was things that get attention. Yep. And the one was something I couldn't do and I can't remember what it was. Oh, something something nobody knows or some some sort of secret thing or something like that. Oh, I love the fact you just played. Well. That's brilliant. Thank you. But I mean, I knew what the exercise was, but I can't remember yeah. the program whether I've said what they are, but you've just done it brilliantly. So okay. if I'm taking your tree, um, do you want to just go wherever you like within that storytelling construct? So either tell us about it, What was interesting was that I immediately started to do the desert island disc thing and cheat slightly. Uh, you know, when they say, you know, can I have a computer and a complete, you know, it, with internet or something like that? Um, because the first, well, the second, first one was, first, first two are sort of common to everybody and bound to shape them. One is parenting, which was solid, middle-class, friendly, loving parenting. The second was education, which of course goes right through average grammar school with sort of slightly Oxbridge pretensions, um, 
very exciting university where I found my status relative to the rest of my generation because before that I'd been in a very limited environment uh, uh, in a small uh, small market town in Lincolnshire. Um, and then the Bristol Ovic Theatre School, the training as an actor, um, which uh, which was just right for me really. Unpretentious, solid, slightly shabby. Um, it was just what I was looking for really. Um, so those actually take care of two of the four. And then thinking about the other ones, obviously the dark one was the death of my wife, leaving me with three children under the age of six. Um, and what was the, and the other one was, I suppose, coming back to the school and just literally teaching there five years after I'd left. And, uh, and you know, how that inevitably shapes one. Um, so those are the things that shaped. And if I may, I think our, our own um, life journeys coincided. Um, I'm trying to remind myself when that, that period of, of your wife's death was, was because I, I came to the school in 86 and I'm pretty it sure was, uh, it was quite raw for yeah. you until then. What year was I it? I think it had just happened, about 85, I think, yes. Gosh, so I do really remember that and your beautiful children growing up as part of the school fabric and being <laughs> plays every now and again. Who would come in and sit at the back of the classroom sometimes, yes. Yes. And wow, what a, what a tale of survival that is, because of course, you know, the difficulty that everyone can appreciate in having to, you know, do your job whilst also being a, a parent of two under six, as you said. I was so bloody lucky. I mean, there aren't many places that could have, that could have taken that. I mean, the theatre school, they would come in, they'd sit in the staff room and play, or they'd occasionally sit at the back of the classroom when I couldn't use the staff room I managed to rejig the um, the timetable to give myself half an hour instead of a quarter of an hour to go and and fetch them uh, from school and bring them back or take them to a friend who would look after them uh, so all that sort of worked its worked itself out very successfully really yes um, considering what a mess it could have been Yes. And they're all still alive and they're all relatively happy. So, And how old are they now? So they're two boys, aren't they? So? 40s. 40s. My son's 43 now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Gosh, time. Yeah. You think. I know. Woo, I know. woo, 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 as we say, but, but epic stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to get the timeline there. Um, so, um, so anything else as to you'd like to tell us about that shaped you or do you, are you ready to move on to what inspires you? Well I think I'm, I'm ready I mean those are the things that shaped me how they shaped me um, in some ways remains to be seen not much time left for it to remain to be seen but um, uh, but I suppose I think that the university experience I went to Kiel University it was a small university only a thousand people and at that time they did this wonderful foundation course. It was a four year course in all. They did a wonderful foundation course, which basically was called the history of Western civilization. <laughs> wow. um, and, and you got lectures from every department in the university. Uh, and I was a very, very bad student. My, my, my father came to a, uh, I, I was engaged. I got engaged while I was at university. My father came to the party and he bumped into one of my tutors, my history tutor, and said, how do you find him as a student? And the man said, casual. <laughs> and I'm afraid I was. <coughs> I was too busy doing, doing drama, yeah. doing the acting, uh, the performing, etc., etc., And also just expanding into other things. I, I did a bit of, of publicity for one society or another. Uh, for the Philosophy Society, in fact, which got me to a, a table with Gilbert Ryle, the, um, uh, the famous philosopher, and A.J. Eyre at one point as well. And, uh, uh, and, and I edited the Union newspaper for a short time and things like that. Yeah. Which sort of, I, I got to try my hand at different things and it was, a, it was a tremendous experience. And it was very exciting. By the end of it, you know, I was there at the time of the great sort of late 60s revolution 
mm. where some of the students took it in their heads to burn the registry. As you I do. wasn't one of them. I wasn't one of them. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, like, it was that sort my, of revolutionary um, band. My father went to Keele University as well, and he got much more involved ah! in the Ents sock. And his, he was famous for dancing with Prince Margaret at one point, because he was the one that... I, 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 uh, right, OK, so... The one who got to dance with Prince Margaret was Malcolm Clark, who was the union president. Was your, was your father the union president? Well, my dad's called Colin Grimes. He's still out there. Um, but he, uh, it, it can't have been the same dance, because um, unless it was the dance... No, no, no. no it's just that she, she always used to dance with the president of the union. Yes. So, oh, okay. but anyway, dad was whipped out to dance with her. Whether, whether the, I can't remember. I'll have to check, actually. It's like hashtag yeah. article, whether he was the president or not. But he yeah. was... No, I actually... I actually managed to insult her, which was a bad move. I didn't mean to. It was just me being a bit pretentious, as you do when you're nervous. I'd done um, a, a Hamlet, the Maravitz Hamlet, at, at, on the fringe. And, um, and so I was introduced to her. And that was the time of the great David Warner Hamlet, which was quite revolutionary, because he wore a sloppy old jumper and jeans. Um, and we started talking about Hamlet and she said, oh, I was invited to see that, but I didn't think I'd like it. Oh. And I wanted to say, well, I think, I don't know. I wanted to say something like, Who, whoever, whoever said that to you, I don't think you should have listened. No, <laughs> which perhaps itself would have been rude. I didn't know to Princess Margaret. What I said was, I think, oh, that was very ill advised. <laughs> she turned like, around. That sounds very, she very. Turned around, and I saw, I saw the back of her head, and that was it. That was the that conversation. That quite polite to me because while, while you were describing it, you could be forgiven thinking, you don't want to come and see Hamlet. You know, fuck off, Margaret. And then, <laughs> <laughs> she, she would probably appreciate that, it more. Uh, yes. So, um, we shared the Keele University experience as well, which is, uh, there's lots of resonance yeah, here, which is lovely. Very interesting. So what, can, can you, you can't remember your father's years there. I know this is not what well, this is about. Well, he was born in 37, so I appreciate he's, six, how old are you, John? He's earlier than me, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was 47, so he's 10 years older than me. Yeah. Sure. And then even I'm catching up, I'm 1962, so I'm 58 next birthday as well. So time. Just to anybody out there who might be looking at this, you're probably very bored. You could skip this bit and go to the next bit. <laughs> Although, tragically, I'm doing this where we don't edit. So anyway, back into the clearing. Uh, yeah. um, okay. <laughs> by the way, we, we, the gallery of extraordinary, the era of the Old Vic Theatre School was extraordinary because we had this gallery of, of the awesome John Hartog and we had the likes of Rudy Shelley and also we had um, uh, uh, Nat yeah, Brennan. Nat. So, so Nat, was my, Nat was my great. He was my inspirer. We, we, you were coming on things that inspire you. Yeah, let's <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, still alive, keep going, you fool. <laughs> and um, uh, and I suppose that's what I sort of. I suppose I wanted to be Nat Brenner uh, when I started teaching, <clears throat> because I think he was the one who fired you up. Rudy was very methodical and slow. Yes, um, and thorough. But it was Nat who made you go, Christ, I want to do this stuff. Yes. And I think it was also terrifying, I remember as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Do you want a story? Yes, I want a story. A Nat Brenner story? Yes, please. I have some of my own, but this isn't about... So, so yes, go we for it. Doing, we were doing yeah. Rex Happy End. Say uh, that Brecht again. Rex's Happy, happy End, I heard that. What was it called? Rex. Bertolt Brecht's Happy End making sure we got that. And it, it, it's a musical, and it's, it's really, it's, it's a bit like Guys and Dolls. It's based around a Damon Runyon story, I think, that inspired it, uh, the same story. And uh, I was playing the, um, the Salvation Army Major, who at the end of the play comes into a Christmas celebration. Uh, the congregation has been padded, the Salvation Army congregation has been padded with hoods, basically. Uh, and um, I come in as an innocent, and somebody tells me that, they've all, that, that they're all hoodlums. Uh, and I had a really good gag that I wanted to do, but I had held it back for the dress rehearsal. 
I got a party blower. And so I came in dressed in, as Santa Claus, as a Salvation Army major, to my Christmas congregation. And I blew the party blower. And as whoever it was, Sister Sarah, told me <clears throat> that this was a congregation of thugs, I just let it roll very, very slowly back in. <laughs> so at the dress rehearsal, none of us knew our lines. <clears throat> and that was incandescent. And of course, I wanted to know how my gag had gone, as any, as any actor would. <laughs> so we get to the end, and we get the Fs. Learn your fucking lines! <laughs> no! Good performance, learn your fucking lines! You, you don't know what you're doing, learn your fucking lines! And after all this, after about five minutes of that, I sort of did that and said, um, Nat, um, what about the gag with the party blower? Good gag. Why did you leave it till the dress rehearsal? Learn your fucking lines. <laughs> that is just so lovely and so resonant with my own story where he terrified the, the fuck out of me. But he was trying to teach me not to stand so close to a fellow actor. But his way of landing that wasn't, Chris, don't stand so close. He just said, what are you standing so fucking close to him for? Do you want to fuck him? And um, I thought, well, that <laughs> occurred. But as you mentioned that, and I think what he was trying to impart with hindsight is Rudy's point of you need to leave an arm and a half's length between you and your fellow. Yeah, actor. yeah. You, <coughs> give you yeah, you do. And it, is, it is still the case and it gets more and more difficult. Uh, now, quite experienced professional directors don't know that if you're working in proscenium arts, you need to leave space between people. Otherwise, you cut the audience out and they don't yeah. get your performance. Absolutely. <clears throat> and it was incredibly seminal, as you say, because of the different paces of it. Now, you, were, you, you gave me the first experience of improvisation properly. And, you know, I run a comedy improvisation company now, partly yeah. due to that beginning of, of coming in slightly naively to think, OK, how can I use improvisation? Um, yeah. And there's, you know, Rudy's pace was, as you say, repetition and slow. And, and he was, you know, ancient and awesome. And so was Nat. He was obviously dying of, of emphysema whilst we were all there as well. Uh, but, you know, he, he would be incredibly irascible and, and terrifying. But both of them, all of you, in your way, you said stuff that you'll never forget. The thing I've never forgotten you telling me in a rehearsal, which you probably have no memory of, and, and I'll just share it with you. You just said that I reminded you with my audition speech as Peter Quince in Midsummer Night's Dream. You very kindly said that I reminded you of Leonard Rossiter, but I can't... Ah. And yeah. you, I, you know, you probably have no memory of that whatsoever. No, yeah, I can see what I can see what I meant. <laughs> I mean, and so long as that was a good thing and not a bad thing. I mean, so long as it didn't make you go, oh God, I'm up for the same parts as Leonard Rossiter. You're a bit younger anyway. You're a bit younger. Yeah. You no, know, it, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because of your seminal memory of what Nat would say to you. You know, at pivotal yes. moments when you've just done a performance. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. About my gag, yeah. and I love that yeah. uh, idea of the party blur and what do you think about my gag? Because we're a similar type of actor, because you want to know whether that, you know, I love <laughs> yes. laugh. Well, that's what actors are. Yeah, yeah. It's that actors, there's the, <clears throat> that thing in, in um, Shakespeare in Love, where the guy is asked about what, um, what Romeo and Juliet's about, and he's playing the nurse, and he says, well, it's about this nurse. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, the way, that's the way actors are. <clears throat> By the way, about the nurse, it's where I learnt the word loquacious and garrulous Woo! Um, because of studying the Matthew in notes off the back of the Franco Zeffirelli film of Romeo and Juliet that got me through my... Oh, really? Right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And John McHenry, did he go to the school, by the way, who played M Malvolio? Yeah, he did. Not Malvolio, I mean Mercutio. Yeah, no, um, Mercutio, yes, he did. He did, and so did, of course, um, <clears throat> I think, so did... Now, am I wrong? Or did she just live at Bath? The lovely woman who played the nurse... I'm pretty sure she was one of us, but I might be Hilda. wrong. No, not Hilda. I'm trying to remember her name now. But you know, this will, we're all trying to, uh, two old people trying to remember people's names. She's boring now. people again. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Get on <there. laughs> anyway, back to the screen. So, um, well, was... when you are completely, sorry. What it's all mean? right, no, go on. I was going to say the other thing, well, one of the other things that inspires, and I think this is, might be a nice angle in the conversation, I don't know how you feel, um, is when, a writer can put lyrics to a tune and make them fit, make them fit perfectly. 
so that neither dominates the other. <clears throat> the business of, <clears throat> I've written quite a lot of songs, as you probably know, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, uh, it's not emphysema as far as I know. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and one of the things that really inspires is songs that manage to give you the lyric and a, and a, a lovely or inspiring tune and actually fit them together perfectly without one over dominating. Um, and that's very rare, I think. And that's it's probably that brought this conversation to a halt. So immediately, what? Sorry. You know the, the Bernie Taupin Elton John relationship where one writes the songs, the other does yeah. the music. Are you thinking about that yeah. sort of elixir of, of the alchemy you find in collaboration? Or are you talking yeah. about the, the mind of a, of, of a musician or writer? I'm thinking, I suppose, I hadn't thought about it as, as, uh, as collaborations, um, though that's there. I had thought about it as um, uh, more about, well, for example, there are periods in history <clears throat> when serious musicians, when there's a fashion for extending syllables, so you've got Handel does it, Baroque stuff, you've got medieval things doing it, where you get the tune demands or asks for, you know, in Handel's case, for example, the refiner's fire in the Messiah, he's trying to, he's trying to um, imitate fire. So he gets this, for he is like a refiner's fire, etc. And then he get, and then you get to a bit where he's going, ha 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 ha. And and actually, at a certain point, I think, oh come on, get in. What's happened to the refiner's fire? I find it slightly uh, irritating that the words have just been used concretely, <clears throat> as you would say in a concrete poem. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So um, in the handle example there, you're saying that's escaped the form and you're not so I find bad. that I find that slightly irritating. And you get it even more so with some of the medieval uh, troubadour singers who, who, who again extend syllables far beyond the point where the word itself has meaning. At least handle is at least handle in that is trying to express the meaning of the word yeah. or, or the fire through extending the word refiners. Okay. And that's so I shouldn't criticize Handel, I suppose, but I'm but when but then when you get down to very simple songs, like I suppose the first time ever I saw your face, that 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 song, you know, or something like um John McLean's Vincent. Yeah. Um some some Sondheim. Sondheim goes both ways. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this whole business of when you when you've got a complex lyric, you have to have a simple tune. Yeah. And it, it, it comes around... If you've got a fast um, lyric, you have to have a simple tune. Yeah. Uh, so Gilbert and Sullivan, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a slow lyric, you can have a beautiful tune and a, um, and a beautiful lyric. And, and the, the brain has time to take it in. Yes. And sometimes some of his very fast tunes, the brain doesn't quite have time to take it in. So you, you admire it stunning fireworks but yeah. you don't quite get time to understand it whereas you know with something like losing my mind or you know sending the clowns or whatever you know he's he's really allowing the lyric and the and the tune to come together and make something particularly wonderful it's just one of those things that i find inspiring yes this idea of trying to find a tune and words that go perfectly together. And what's lovely is your notice, your, your, your appreciation when it doesn't quite fit that and it actually leaks. Because you, what, you, yeah. what you notice is that, is that when it, like economy of message, you no know, Shakespeare renowned for you know, only writing 50 words because that all that's all it takes and less yeah, more yeah. 300. Mm -hmm. So the economy of message thing, you know, the, the, mus the author of the, the music either gets it right or wrong or it leaks is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. And I, I um, get fascinated by the construct of jokes in a similar way as to whether the scansion is right. You know, the, the, the number of syllables has to be right, you know. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, you sort of know, don't you? Um, yeah. When you get to a piece of writing, 
that this should be shorter or it should be longer, or if only we can get that idea tightened into something that has enough punch, yes, musically, if you like, yes. then the laugh is bigger. And that, that idea of tightness and try and say something different to make it as impactful, this is slightly tangential, but one of the most extraordinary bits of drama teaching I ever observed was a teacher I was observing who I thought was phenomenal. Uh, this was when I was doing my teaching practices back at the Central School of Script and Trauma before I came to the Bristol Public Theatre School. But it was somebody um, saying to a group of school girls, trying to explain why Macbeth behaves in the way that he behaves, sort of egged on by Lady Macbeth. And what he cut to was this following reason. The reason he behaves in the way that he does is he's completely and utterly fuckstruck with his wife. <laughs> yes. yes. And the doors that dropped as he said that, but I, 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 I've thought about it many, many times subsequently about whether anyone could say it in any way differently, but have the same <laughs> impact. Yeah. And yeah. He, may or may not agree with that, but I just thought it was a phenomenal bit of that economy of message, boof, right there. No, it's taken me to another Nat, Nat Brenner story, actually. It was the same production, an interesting <laughs> production. It was, it was Happy End. The guy playing the lead um, started having an affair with uh, one of the ladies in the box office. As you do. <laughs> As, well, <laughs> As some of us may do sometimes, um, and um, uh, and it turned out <clears throat> that this lady was married. I think probably separated, but still literally married <clears throat> to the son of the local capo mafioso. Oh, and um, this guy got wind of what was going on, <clears throat> and. The lead actor, who was playing a character called Bill Cracker, uh, a gangster himself, let himself into his room, his apartment, whatever it was, his flat one day, to find a rather small Italian man there who proceeded to beat him up comprehensively. <clears throat> uh, and uh, he didn't need any makeup that night. He comes in in the first scene having had a run in with a with a hood called the gorilla and having killed him basically. But Mike had a broken tooth and bruises and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> and the local family wanted the, wanted Mike out of town. I shouldn't have said Mike, sorry. Whoa, whatever his name was. Dave. They wanted him out of town. <clears throat> they wanted Dave out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And Nat was stuck with the show and he had to go and have coffee with this little old man, who was the father of the husband. And they had a cup of coffee and uh, the position was explained. And Nat said, no, well, no, no. What I have to tell you is that I was coming out of the school at lunchtime. Nat was getting into a taxi to go and deal with the situation. And he was just needed to talk to somebody. He said, Johnny, 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 get in. I didn't know what was going on. And he just fulminated at me <clears throat> on the journey to the theatre. So to tell you what he said to the mafioso, it was, if the lad has to go, I have to close the show. If the show closes, that will mean the Bristol Old Vic closing. It will mean... <clears throat> questions being asked and people will be very unhappy, particularly the members of the council, etc, etc. So he said, if you let the run finish, then I guarantee that the lad will be out of town on the first train after. And that was the deal they made. But what Nat said to me in the taxi about, about the actor was, Johnny! You can be cock proud and you can be cunt struck, but not both at the same time. <laughs> that is so amazing. He just said it how it was, is the thing. He did. You can't do that nowadays. I mean, you, you know how to do that now. nowadays. <laughs> no, I mean, well, that's clear. And so did, the, did Dave leave town after the production finished? 
Dave left town and and for a for a week or two and then came back. Yeah, right. Anna was satisfied, I think. Yeah. Anna was satisfied. In, in fluffier, lovey terms, the show must go on. <laughs> so the show went the on. Show, the Matthew yeah. show. Uh, and there's, of course, the Renato's pub. I don't know if it's connected. Don't go there. But the, the Renato's <coughs> pub was always next door. And yeah. there was definitely an Italian presence yeah. around the pub, around the Theatre Royal. Uh, the yeah, rest yeah. Of the evening, shall we say. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, look, let's, this is a wonderful um, ramble of, of, of ideas, which is great. So uh, we're back in the clearing. So in a nutshell, what's the alchemy and goal that you've most enjoyed bringing in your illustrious career as, as head of the acting courses and directing and poet? Mr. John Harter, what's, what's the alchemy and goal that you know you love to bring? <coughs> in, in, to inspire, as I said, I wanted to be Nat. I wanted to inspire people. I didn't want people to, or well, not Nat. You see, I don't think I've been, ever been a great teacher as such. I think I've been a facilitator. What, I've, what, what, what I, I feel that I have offered, particularly with certain people, is is sort of understanding um directing i've always said i don't i'm not i'm not sitting back watching i'm standing by the actor experiencing a lot of the time anyway so what i'm trying to do when i'm directing is as it were stand in the actor's shoes and try to work out what it is that if, if anything that's getting between them uh and uh and giving the role a better result creating a better result um uh, because it's often <clears throat> you know i mean i often a, fa a favorite way of introducing a note is i can see you're not comfortable there that, that works both ways a sometimes because i realize that they're not comfortable there do they know why do they know they're uncomfortable do they know why is it perhaps just where they're standing uh, is it something that's just happened? Whatever it is, but the actor somehow is uncomfortable. I also have used it somewhat mendaciously sometimes when I've needed to nudge somebody, given them quite a hard nudge into a certain area to say, you're not comfortable with that. I think this is why. And, it, you know, they may have thought they were comfortable with it. They may even have been comfortable with it, but it was wrong. So I'm actually approaching it from the point of view of, of empathizing with them. What are actors? Actors are people who empathise, basically. So that, that's what you need from a director as well. I think if you're a director like me, there are there are other directors who in the past certainly have been completely different. But for me, it's actually that feeling of empathising with the actor. So that I think is something I can bring. Um, uh, and the, the idea, like, by the way, I love that, the idea of the, the director as conduit or as an enabler, someone to really notice and, and, and conduit is the word I use. Yeah, we're all conduits. The, the the writer, the writer is here. The writer, or the creator. It could be an improvised thing, but the you know the writer. Let's call him a writer because it's the easiest way at the moment. The writer's there. The audience is there. The director's here. The actor's there. You've got designers and people around as well. But essentially, the director's job and the designer's job and you know all the all the stage crew's job. All the or the creative's job is to be a conduit and the actor is the sort of last conduit before the audience and that's what you're there for you're there to, to make the transition from the writer's inspiration to the audience's ear eyes spirit etc as as smooth and exciting as possible as clear yeah that's what I think it's about. Um, there was something else I was going to By say. By the way, just to hold that thought, I th just to hold that thought, I think yeah. that's just such a beautiful legacy about this is what I think, in, this is what you think directing is. It's duty to enable the author's voice as the conduit. Yeah, I just think that's, that's really lovely. And that's why I hate it. That's why I hate it when directors go off on one of their own. And, actors, and similarly, actors, as we know, can be incredibly self-centered and go off on their own. I they can't. Like, yes. Yeah. Favorite actors. Yeah. It's, it's that business about what? What is it about? <clears throat> is it about the actor coming to the part, or the part coming to the actor? And yeah. people, actors who make the part come to them. Well, you can do it in in a way. You can do it as a star. You know, 
I mean, somebody like, bless him, Roger Moore, you know, he made the part come to him and everybody loved him. You know, that was any, and, and you know, he would be quite frank about it. He said, that's what I do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, it's not banned, but mm. for me, if you like, proper acting is to do with you, with the actor going to the part. Yeah. It's character acting, really. Character acting is what I find most exciting and interesting. Beautifully put. And it links so brilliantly to the idea of coaching, the idea of nudging, noticing, enabling. It, it, I love that. There's a great coaching question. I noticed that you're not very happy there. Is a, is a, is a really good way to get someone yeah. to... It's a, it's, <coughs> yeah. The discomfort. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. 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 Great. So, um, do you want to tell us a quirky or unusual fact about you, Mr. John Hartock? You've been on the open road beautifully, by the way, talking about all sorts of really interesting stuff, but a quirky or unusual <laughs> fact that you possibly know about you? There aren't, I, think, I think there aren't very many quirky, interesting facts about me, certainly very few that I'd want to publicise. If but I may, by one... the way, you are a quirky and an unusual fact. <laughs> That's what I like about you. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't seem like that from in here. Um, I'm beginning to realise I am, actually, when I, I, I suddenly, it's one of those things that you, you know, having been on a sort of, I don't know what to say a treadmill, the theatre school wasn't like a treadmill, but having been in a place where whatever my personality was, it sort of fitted in and seemed normal. Now I come outside of it um, and I suddenly realise that I'm a bit weird in some ways. Um, but the thing I thought of, thing, It's a beautiful thing to be a maverick, to swim slightly in a different direction, to be one of a kind, to be, you know, there's that thing about authenticity, be yourself because everyone else is taken, but to find one's own sense of belonging with, amongst yeah. the chaos that you, yeah, you that was, like, was yeah. going on for you is a, a really lovely story. Yeah, that was, no, a a, no, it's not a poem. And, and the funny thing is, when I opened this book the other day, it quite naturally fell open to the right page. And I don't know which the page is. Um, and, uh, no, it won't. And I thought, oh, well, if I get to that, I'll, um, I'll mention it. <clears throat> and you were talking about Shakespeare doing something in 50 words, which was quite interesting because Mini this was a Daily Telegraph. I don't know whether they still do it. A Daily Telegraph sort of competition. Because um, the podcast as well as a Zoom film, can you just say the title of the book in your hand, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's eight years old. It's called Mini Sagas from the Daily Telegraph competition. Okay. Edited by Brian Aldiss, who I'm not sure if he's around anymore. Um, but I, I, I went in for this. And you have to write the story in 50 words. And uh, I'm not going to find it, am I now? And I managed to, um, you, the, 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 the cheat was, you were allowed to uh, use as many words for the, the title as you liked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a fairly long title <clears throat> and I had uh, and I had a, a you can't cut this can you this is going to be very boring because I really can't find it that's really stupid um, and I got into this what we're ramping up to by the way but keep um, flipping but what, what we're ramping up to is the idea of a cherry i'm going to award you with a metaphorical cake where you can impart okay, um, a cherry okay. On cake. all i would say just to say that what i the point i was getting to was that i shared a pair a page with beryl bainbridge and so oh. that was my sort of that was my little claim to fame she was on one side of the page i was on the other her little story and my little story together so <clears throat> i was quite proud of that but i can't find it now so you are in that book next to beryl bainbridge with your next to Beryl. story yeah and i'm happy to wait for a couple of seconds while you find it because obviously it's not you can eat you know um less and more well you could use the index or even the contents to find john Hunter. there doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be an index i'm not sure there's no they, they just divide it into sections and that's uh oh this is this is really <laughs> very very annoying um we talked about as I said, and here we are as you would expect as you, as you would expect, it fell open at the right page before because that was the only page I ever used to look at. Um, and, uh, and, and now I can't find it. But never mind, we'll just have to leave that one. Anyway, me and Beryl were like that. And um, it, was a, it was a nice little thing. She got paid for hers, I didn't for mine. 
That is show business right there. That is show business, absolutely. Especially it's now. It's like show business. Especially, it's no business either. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think, are you happy that we'll sort of uh, yeah. make that something to, uh, if you find it, send me well, the well, text. Well, sorry, if I find it what? It's, we can send me the text to it and I can link it to what it is I'm gonna publish. Or, um, you know, okay, we, yeah. we can do a sort of a, appendix film where we get you just to do your 50, because um, you you've hooked us now, we're intrigued, but we haven't been delivered. So we'll leave us, leave us hanging, which is great. It, it's, Come um, on, you. Keep talking. Keep it's a talking. cliffhanger. So, uh, John, um, yeah. in warning you now, having done us the great courtesy of coming into the clearing where we've shaken your apple tree to talk about 54321, some alchemy and some gold, I'm going to award you with a cherry on the cake now. Sorry, a cake that you're allowed to put a cherry on the top of. What's the best bit of advice you'd like to leave us with? Or it might be the best bit of advice you've ever been given, or just just a parting thought from the lovely John Hartog. Well, it's what I was going to say earlier, and I've just remembered it, which I think is in in our business. And I know obviously you will agree because of the the side of the business you've landed on. Uh, but it is so important to cultivate lightness of heart, and it needs cultivating, particularly in these days. Uh, and I think, you know, it was a thing that Rudy always went on about. He said, sometimes my students look at me as if to say, do you think I am a child? And I look at them as if to say, I bloody well hope so. Lovely. John, I, a lightness of heart is a, is a really beautiful, beautiful way to end this edition of what you need is a damn good listening to with me, Chris Grimes, and the great joy in talking to John Hartock. And um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get it on film. I'd love to come around and see your barn and share a glass of wine with you at some point. Well, I'm in the Quantox. I'm in the Quantox. Hartox um, in the Quantox. I like that. <laughs> in the Quantox. If you like, I can take you up to Quantox, yes. I'll talk. Uh, I'll talk. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that'd be nice to see you. Yeah. You uh, too. Halfway between Bridgewater and Taunton. Come and see us. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today on what you need. It's been lovely, Chris. With me, it's been Chris. lovely. Goodbye. Bye.